after the neighbor continues to pressure her about the pregnancy, she tells the neighbor that she's pregnant by her stepfather. She ended up uh, talking to us about her uh, having sex with her father. It began when she was around 11 or 12 years of age. The body began to bloat and become unearthed. And I asked her, well, tell me how your mother died. And she says, I think my father killed her. Welcome to the Crime Stories Control Room. This is Murder Time. The crime story I'm pulling from the vault today is about a preacher with a deadly take on the good book. A preacher that terrorizes and abuses his own kids. Our story begins in December of 2004 with a ringing telephone in the Child Advocacy Center of the Mobile, Alabama Police Department. The call from someone named Carolyn Kelly is answered by Corporal Detective Michael Shavers. I received a phone call about 12.40 in the afternoon from neighbor of Anthony Hopkins who advised that Anthony's daughter was over there and told her that she had been having sex with her father. Detective Shavers listens carefully as Carolyn Kelly tells him more about the troubled young woman in her kitchen. Investigator Kent Quinney picks up the story. This particular day it was cold outside. Charlene was walking down the street with no shoes on. Carolyn felt sorry for her and invited her into the home, into her house to get warm and gave her clothes to put on. Carolyn asks Shalene, what's going on? What's wrong with her? Shalene advised her that she's pregnant. The frightened young woman doesn't say much more. Shalene tells Carolyn, you really don't want to know what's going on with me. Into the investigation almost immediately is District Attorney Ashley Rich. Rich is the first woman ever elected as district attorney for the 13th Judicial Circuit of the District of Alabama. After the neighbor continues to pressure her about the pregnancy, she tells the neighbor that she's pregnant by her stepfather, Anthony. Shalene was 19 at the time, and she told the neighbor that she was running away because she had an argument with her father. Shalene's stepfather, Anthony Hopkins, is a certified man of God. In 2001, Anthony got his pastor's certificate from the APH Holiness Church of God in Mobile, and he began preaching at various churches in Mobile County. At the Child Advocacy Center, Corporal Mike Shavers gathers details. She was 19 at the time. We were able to figure out that uh, the sex had actually occurred prior to her being uh, 18. Shavers asks the shaken Shailene Hopkins to please come in for an interview. Detective Michael Shavers is a solidly built, no-nonsense investigator who sports a shaved head. His imposing appearance belies an empathetic nature. He's well-suited to working with children, with a soft voice and a gentle giant manner. He draws a sordid story from a shattered Shailene. She ended up uh, talking to us about her uh, having sex with her father. It began when she was around 11 or 12 years of age. Over the next hours, Shailene shares an ever more shocking story. It begins when Shailene's mother, Arletha, falls in love with a honey-tongued Anthony. More from District Attorney Ashley Rich. Anthony Hopkins met Arletha in Georgia. They were married in 1994. Arletha had two children from a previous marriage. Anthony adopted those as his own, and they began having their own children. The couple has six more kids and molds the family into a gospel singing group. Here's Detective Kent Quinney. The family was a very talented group of kids. They each played their own instruments. Uh, they traveled throughout the southern region playing in different churches. They also were great singers as well. Canvassing church parishioners, Quinney learns that the children's performances are uplifting. But there's something else. Congregation thought the children was kind of strange. Most children play, but these children acted like soldiers, because even in church, they would sit up at attention. They wouldn't even move. D.A. Ashley Rich. By all accounts, the children were meticulously dressed. 
They were always very, very nice and polite. They never acted up in church. They sat on the front row. They sat in sequential order by age. The families lived in Mobile for a year when Hopkins lands a congregation of his own. Soon after, he makes a startling announcement. Anthony sat down with the children and he told them how mother had abandoned them. She went off to California and got a job as a seamstress and she wasn't coming back. When they're told Arletha's gone, Arletha's family in Georgia reaches out. Detective Quinney. The family members tried to contact Aletha on several occasions, but the numbers that they received, they would call and, they, and say the long, number is no longer in order. She didn't return any kind of text that was sent. So throughout the entire process of them trying to contact her, they never heard from Aletha. The motherless family regroups under Father Anthony's strict control and resumes entertaining in local churches. After Aletha was gone, people thought very highly of Anthony, being that he was a single father raising eight kids alone, and being as talented as they were, he was able to manage eight kids all by himself. But looks can be deceiving. Behind closed doors, Hopkins begins grooming a substitute for his missing wife. The oldest daughter, Shalene, assumed all of the duties of head of the household. She was responsible for the care of all the children, making sure they were fed and clothed and educated. And she was the one who was responsible for making sure that life went on for those children. The family keeps to itself. The children are homeschooled and dutifully perform in church. It isn't long before the good pastor convinces his eldest stepdaughter that her duties now include providing pleasures of the flesh. Anthony justified his actions by telling Charlene, it was okay, it's okay to do this. See, here it is in the Bible, read it. The impressionable and defenseless child complies. Anthony told Shalene that he loved her and that God would approve, and she was confused. He would use the Bible to manipulate her into believing that what they were doing was okay. Hopkins keeps his kids completely isolated, constantly reinforcing his brand of mind control. But under the skillful questioning of Detective Michael Shavers, Shalene slowly opens up. I went on to ask her about uh, her siblings, whether or not she believed any of them had been sexually abused. And she told us that uh, her second oldest sister, she believed had had sex with her father, but she had no details to prove anything to that point. Adds Detective Quinney. At one point, we believed that Shalene had got jealous of Tawana because Anthony was paying closer attention to her and now that she was pregnant, that he was no longer interested in her, but in Tawana. As the interview winds down, Shavers struggles to process all he's heard. The interview was basically over with her about all the sexual contact between her and her father and everything. Uh, she had told me earlier that her mother had died. And I asked her, well, tell me how your mother died. And she says, I think my father killed her. The air leaves the room. As she unspools the past, Shailene takes Shavers even deeper into a world of moral corruption. The story was crazy. I mean, it was unbelievable. It had a lot of details to it, but you just wondered if she could make up something like that. Her claim about her murdered mother sends Shavers to the war room. He needs intel. He needs department databases. He needs to know everything he can about Arletha Hopkins. So at that point, I proceeded to my office where we searched the uh, computer records, trying to find uh, any record of Miss Hopkins. Uh, we searched the driver's license, which her driver's license had actually expired in 2005 and hadn't been renewed, and searched all the other systems, and we were unable to find any record of her into, since 2005. Knowing that the mother of his rape and incest victim has been disappeared prompts a new question. And I said, well, where's your mother's body at? And she says, it's in the house. 
Shavers reaches out to homicide detective Kent Quinney. Quinney is on the move in minutes. At first when we heard the story, we thought it was kind of bizarre and we never heard anything like that before. But bizarre or not, Shavers and Quinney set out to confirm the facts. After being told about uh, the mother's death, I actually ended up typing a search warrant and ended up uh, proceeding over to Judge Michael McMakin's house. He'd never heard anything like this and wanted uh, requested that we call him back and let him know whether or not we found a body in the house. But we had to go to the location and verify her story and to check it out to make sure. The detectives approach the home. We end up getting to the house with a search warrant and entered, the, entered through the back door. No one is home. The house is exceptionally tidy. I'm a retired military vet, uh, and the house itself was set up like a boot camp, uh, like the dorms we used to do when for inspection, all-time all ready inspection. The rooms were all very neat and tidy. Uh, the beds were made. Shoes were all lined up in a perfect line under the, under the beds. Uh, there's a desk in there. No toys in there. Even the kids' bikes were lined from the tallest to the smallest. Even the balls in the corner were neatly placed and arranged by color. It was all like a military manner. It's clear Hopkins is very particular. Here's behavioral scientist, Dr. Steve Warmoth. Well, the operative word is control. Some people have this inherent need to be con in control of all aspects of their environment, and that includes right down to the family. Shailene leads Quinny and Shavers to a locked door. As we open the door, you can start to see the flies start to gather in the doorway. You could smell the smell of decomp body, so there was no doubt that there was some kind of body around there. Flies gathering, the smell of decomposition. And there, in the dim light, they spot a squat, square object. It was a small white freezer with tape wrapped around it to seal it, which kind of made my thoughts go from, you know, well, it's really not true to, uh-oh, it's, it's becoming real. It's then that the investigators realize Shailene has told the truth, the whole truth. You'd go over and look in the freezer. You could look down the side of the freezer, and you could actually make out the web of a hand. I mean, it's unbelievable that there's actually a body inside the freezer. My heart started racing. It was like, oh my god, what do we do here next? They lock down the scene. Detective Quinney calls for forensic backup. Medical examiner John Krolikowski takes one look, then calls for an evac. So we remove the entire freezer and the contents to uh, our facility here in Mobile uh, for examination. Processing a freezer with a frozen body inside presents unique challenges for Krolikowski. It was a real problem because the freezer had a lot of insulating material to it and the block was stuck to the inside of the insulation. So we couldn't just remove the remains. Uh, we had to strip very carefully so we didn't introduce any artifact to the remains, any, any uh, injuries that we would have created and take a look at the remains after they had had a chance to thaw. A body emerges as the block of solid ice melts. Dental records confirm the decomposing corpse inside the freezer is Arletha Hopkins. But the advanced state of decomposition presents a serious problem. We couldn't determine a specific cause of death in this case, but the individual being placed in a freezer is certainly very unusual, highly suspicious. We went on to look at the bony material and asked experts in the field to determine if there were any knife marks, any knife wounds, or any other lesions that they could help us with. Uh, and we pursued things such as DNA. Detectives Shavers and Quinney and their forensic team continue processing the Hopkins home. Here's Kent Quinney. At this particular time, we brought in blood specialists from the Alabama Department of Forensic Science, where they spray luminol in each room trying to detect blood splatter. As any true crime junkie knows, 
luminol reacts to iron and hemoglobin to reveal the presence of blood, even blood that's been mopped up. In the master bedroom, the luminol reveals that blood has been spilled. We also sprayed Shalene's bedroom for traces of semen. We did detect traces of semen on her sheets, which were also collected as evidence. Every detail of Shailene's disturbing story of murder and juvenile rape appears to be true, including the father controlling the minds of the children. D.A. Ashley Rich. As we moved from room to room, we saw a lot of pictures of the family, but none of those pictures had Arletha in the family photos. Arletha was their mother. Arletha was a large part of their life. And there were absolutely no pictures, no evidence whatsoever that Arletha had a part of that household at all. Behavioral scientist Steve Warmoth. This is by design on Hopkins' part. It's a morbid effort uh, on his behalf to remove any symbolic representation of his former spouse in the eyes of the children. And children I mean, not having the cognitive development stages you know, that we as adults have I mean, will you know, f more easily forget you know, the, the presence of their, their mother. And the good preacher has tightened his control over Shailene in other ways. D.A. Ashley Rich explains. On the night of the horrific argument, Arletha had actually seen Anthony touching and fondling Shailene. So Arletha tosses the perverted preacher out. After Arletha kicked Anthony out of the house, Arletha said to Shalane, I would rather die than let someone abuse you. Arletha doesn't know just how prophetic those words are or how conflicted her eldest daughter is. When Hopkins knocks at Shalene's window later that night, she opens it. Detective Kent Quinney. When she lets him in the house, some way, Arletha hears this and goes to Charlene's room and bangs on the door and tells Anthony, get out of here, get out of here. You don't have no business in here. But Hopkins is once again inside the house, and this time, he's not leaving. He's got a holy reputation to protect. He's got a plan. He's got murder in mind. Eventually, Anthony goes outside of the room and pushes Arletha into her room. And he tells the kids, stay in the room, and don't come out until I tell you. Anthony and Arletha were arguing, they were fighting, there was screaming going on in the bedroom. Shalene was in a separate bedroom from her parents. She was hearing this arguing and fighting going on. She heard a thump. The commotion wakes up Shalene's baby brother who'd been sleeping beside his parents' bed. Shailene enters the master bedroom. And when she walked into that room, she saw her mother on the floor. And she noticed that her mother was kicking her feet up and down as though she was gasping for air and saying, help. The last thing she saw was her father standing over Arletha's head um, on that floor in that bedroom. One can only wonder what Shailene must be thinking. Hopkins orders her out. Shailene tries to calm the other children down and get them to sleep. And as soon as she does that, Anthony comes into the room and tells Shailene that her mother's dead. With a corpse in the freezer and a terrible testimony of killing, Rich, Quinny, and Shavers have plenty of evidence to collar Hopkins. But He's outside their jurisdiction. They reach out to Clark County and Sheriff's Officer Ron Baguette. The vehicle that Anthony Hopkins was driving was a vehicle that he had financed, and the finance company installed a GPS tracking device. This device is what was used to locate the vehicle. Baguettes led to a church outside Jackson, Mississippi. A service is underway, and the Hopkins family is mid-song. So I look through the crack of the swinging doors and I notice Anthony Hopkins inside the church. My adrenaline got pumped up and I was excited. I was wanting to get this guy caught. But I was also concerned that because of the children was there, we may have a hostage situation. And as I walked down the aisle, everything got real quiet. And I walked up to Anthony Hopkins and I asked him, 
if that if indeed was his name. And he said, yes, it was. So I immediately put handcuffs on him and got him detained. The congregation started yelling and screaming and, and applauding and saying hallelujah, praise the Lord as I was escorting back out of the church. And I felt like they was almost happy that I was bringing them out of the church. Ashley Rich continues. They took Anthony out of the front doors. They patted him down and he asked, what have I done? I looked at him and said, I don't know, Mr. Hopkins, it may have something to do with the dead body in your deep freeze. For once, the smooth talking preacher has nothing to say, for a minute anyway. And he immediately locked his body up and froze. And then in just a few minutes, he asked me, could he speak to his oldest daughter? And I told him, no, you're not speaking to anyone else. Hopkins and his children are driven to the Mobile Police Station. Even now, the children's extreme social programming is on display, according to Detective Michael Shavers. All the kids were real polite and just nice as they could be. I actually asked them if they wanted something to eat, and they all looked to the oldest sibling that was there at that point and, uh, and said, no, we don't want anything. But Detectives Michael Shavers and Kent Quinney and District Attorney Ashley Rich do want something. They want to know how exactly Shailene knew her mother was in that freezer. On April 5th, 2010, Alabama preacher Anthony Hopkins is tried for the murder of his wife, Arletha. The prosecution's key witness, stepdaughter, Shailene. The jury hears about the night of her mother's murder. Hopkins comes into her bedroom and orders Shailene to help him. District Attorney Ashley Rich. Shalene came into the room and saw her mother's body. Anthony told Shalene that God wanted them to clean this up to convince her that she needed to help him move the body. Anthony wrapped Arletha's body in a blanket. Anthony asked Shalene to help him move the body to their vehicle. So together, they drag what's left of Arletha to the car and drive to Sims, Alabama. Here's Detective Quinney. He just laid her on the ground. He didn't bury her or anything. He just laid her out there in, in the woods. After returning home, Hopkins decides he can do better. He wakes up his eldest daughter. They went back to Sims to get the body. Hopkins then buries his dead wife behind a church in Jackson. A few days after that, he gets the jitters again. And Anthony went back to where he had buried the body. And the body began to bloat and become unearthed. And again, Shailene helps. They drive Arletha's now bloated, decomposing body back to the family home, Kent Quinney. They brought her back here to Mobile, where Shailene said she don't know where her father purchased this freezer from. It was a small freezer that he asked her to help place her mother in. It's small, a bit too small. A horrifying scene plays out. He realized that he had to try to squeeze her in there, so he jumped up and down on her body till she fit in the freezer. He jumped up and down on her until she fit in the freezer. The jury hear once again how Anthony Hopkins controls the minds of his children. Anthony controlled these children by using the Bible, by using um, the church, and by manipulating them into doing what he wanted them to do, by saying that that's what God would want them to do, that's what the Bible would uh, tells them to do. What these children went through, having their father kill their mother, was excruciatingly painful. But it was even more painful um, when the case went to trial. Taking the jury through every single minute of the crime is part of DA Ashley Rich's strategy. We wanted to make sure at trial that we convinced the jury of the horrific acts that this man had done so that we could put him away for as long as possible. 
so that he could never get back out and harm somebody else. On May 21st, 2010, the jury takes just 90 minutes to find Hopkins guilty of murder, rape, sodomy, incest, and sexual abuse. He is serving a life sentence plus 55 years in Ventress Correctional Facility in Clayton, Alabama. Hopkins is eligible for parole July 1st, 2023. And that's your murder time for today. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. Simon Decker wrote and produced The Deep Freeze Killer, working with files from the television series Crime Stories, Blood, Lies, and Alibis, and Catching Killers. Our executive producer is Ron Getz. Our supervising producer is Robert Laughlin, and our technical producer is Joe Watts. Murder Time is a production of Partners in Motion.